You're listening to Boudoir Therapy, hosted by Darlene Wong. I fly over oceans and by sea. Join me in my private boudoir where I raise the volume in the presence of coveted feminine and empowering business women I call the queens. Why can't we just be? Why can't we just be? You are not living life if you are not living your inner art. I'm really happy to introduce to you Lorraine Wime. When I was younger, I struggled a lot with identity, I think as most teenagers do. I had a period of about a decade where I searched for myself in all kinds of places. Um, until my mother harassed me to go back to school. She, she was afraid that, see, I grew up thinking I was stupid. I was cute, but I didn't think I was smart. My sister and my, my father was an intellectual and my sister was really smart. And they used to, they used to make me believe stuff. Uh, they would tell me something and I would say, oh my God, really? And then they would start laughing and say, you're so stupid. How could you believe that? And I actually internalized that and thought, I, I really thought I wasn't that smart. Anyways, 27, well, 26, my mom was really afraid that I, my life was going to come to nothing. So she, she really, she said, you got to go back to school. And she harassed me so much that I said, listen, pick a program and I'll apply. If I get in, I'll go. And if I don't get in, the case is closed. You stop harassing me and I could just go on with my life. And she picked something. I applied. I got in uh, and I discovered I was smart. I mean, I was really smart. And then I thought, wow, I could do this. What started out as a one-year uh, diploma, after six months, my mom started saying, oh, my God, what if you did a BA? And then I would say, Mom, I just said I would do a one-year. And then, she, then I did the BA, and I finished with honors. She says, oh, my God, what if you did a master's degree? And I'm like, Mom? And she says, oh, my God, what if you did a PhD? So anyways, we went all the way up to the PhD. But then it's, it's really interesting because when you, you're in school for 10 years and then you, you have this goal and you keep, you keep climbing towards it and, you, and then you get like way up on that mountain and then when you get to the top there's really nothing but right you, there's just it almost feels like you, the next step is that you jump off i mean where else are you going to go from there right so it was a weird feeling to work like a decade towards achieving something and then you get there and you say well now what so then i worked in academia for a little while but uh, it's tricky academia by the time i finished my phd for every position available in my field they were about five to seven hundred applicants so you competed oh with goodness. people who already had books published who had degrees for ha from harvard who right it was a very difficult thing to be in you spent on average i would say most people with a phd in literature would spend four years looking for a job and then you get a job but then it's a seven-year thing before you're tenured and 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 then i mean it's a, it you know what it felt like it felt like i was a an animal in a in a circus and i had to keep jumping through hoops on fire i had to keep proving to people that i was smart and that i could you know it was a constant and an academic interview lasts an entire day Right? They fly you in and it starts seven o'clock in the morning. You know, you, you, you have like breakfast with the director of the department. And then after that, you meet all the faculty and then you give a talk to the, to the graduate students. Then you sit with the dean and then you say, it's, it's 24 hours. And, and they do this with every applicant? Yeah. And you're on, you have to be sharp and you have to, you have to watch everything you say, everything you, you have to, after you finish the PhD mm -hmm. and you've defended, you, you wrote a dissertation right which is which means a dissertations means that you have to write something that is, so literature has been around for what six seven centuries you i have to write something about literature that has never been written about or published before which is crazy because people have been doing literature for like seven <laughs> centuries right so after you've you've gone through all there's like no pressure here right none, <laughs> no. none at all 
none at all. So you're trying to get into a really good program. You're trying to get it because I studied in the state, so there's no way I could have afforded it, right? So I, 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 you know, I had scholarships and grants and awards and that kind of stuff. So you have to constantly compete for those, and then you have to compete with people in your department because you have to have a GPA of 4.1 or 4.3 or whatever it is that you, right? That will, and then you have to publish, which is oh my God, let's let's don't get me started about publishing. They, and then once you've done all that, you go on the job market, you apply for jobs for uh, about four months, the process is. When the job list comes out, by the time the job list comes out and you've sent out all of your applications, it's four months. So you can't, you put everything on hold for four months just to apply for jobs. And then you get flown to do 24 hour interviews and then at the end nothing comes out of it right wait a second like so do you have your own private jet or it's like something that's given to you by the school is it paid by the government like this must be really expensive yeah they have a short list a long list of candidates and if you make the short list so let's say that they have five people maybe three of them will be in the vicinity and two will be from outside and they'll have to fly you in so Universities typically don't have that big of a budget to do that, but recruiting is important, so if they have a budget, then yeah, they'll fly you in, not first class, and mm -hmm. certainly not uh, you know on the best uh, on the best schedule. But yeah, they'll fly you in mm -hmm. and put you up in a hotel. Next morning they pick you up. The interview is 24 hours. They bring you back late at night, and then the next morning you fly out, and then you sit by the phone, and then nothing happens, right? I'm already tired. <laughs> so, yeah, so you're sitting by the phone, but you're like really sleeping by the phone. Like and you must be exhausted, or are you like wired up? No, you're not wired up. You're exhausted intellectually because you you have to be on. Like you know, you're you're giving a talk to graduate students. You're giving a talk to the faculty. You have to explain why your research is cutting edge and why it's more important than everybody else's. They're going to interview and and why you're a great teacher and why you're a great researcher. And 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 the funny thing about academia though is that it's a very unnurturing environment in the sense that you know that it the whole point of being an intellectual is to be able to share knowledge right and to exchange ideas but you can't do that in academia because there's such a pressure to publish and there's such a pressure to have original ideas and to teach original classes that nobody wants to actually talk to other academics because you don't want somebody to take your idea or to publish your idea or to so you, you have all of this knowledge that you have to hoard in fear that you may lose your edge and then it becomes, what's the point, right? It's, it's actually not a very nurturing, well, that was my experience anyways. I love how you said you have to hold in all this knowledge you're hoarding, you're hoarding it in fear. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. crazy. I know. You know what, I agree though a bit with you because I've realized that the way to grow is to share. Mm -hmm. And if we don't share the mm -hmm. information, well, someone's just going to keep repeating it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And no one's going to grow. Mm -hmm. That sounded like you were on speed there for like, what, 10 years? <laughs> well, was it? No, the, the first four doing the undergrad was, was actually fun because I was discovering I was smart. And that was really interesting to me. I, I didn't know. I, saw this, I also discovered I could write which also I didn't know. And um, so that was fun. The master's degree was a um, little challenging. I chose to go to Toronto, but I didn't want to move there, so I was commuting. Uh, so that was, that, was, that was challenging. But then the whole time you're doing your master's degree, you're starting applying to PhD programs. Then you, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Well, by the time I got to the master's degree, it started getting a little stressful. You know, how are you going to finance it? Yeah. And it's not, not just though you're applying for the grants and, and the scholarships, not just to finance your education, but also to gain, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Get the really prestigious grants. Makes your application more valid, right? More valuable. People want to hire a faculty that already has on its CV all of these accolades and awards. And it's a lot of pressure mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. How did you deal with the pressure? Like, I'm sure there was instances where you felt doubt or fear. Like, how do you how did you deal with that? Yeah, it, it, <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't even remember. I just remember being on a constant kind of a adrenaline rush, right? And also, there's a lot of doubt because by the time you get to the PhD, right, you, it's the cream of the crop, right? I mean, you, if, when you're trying to determine who's smarter in a PhD program, you're really cutting hair in four. Because if, you, if you've gotten to the PhD, you, you're badass. You, you know, you've, 
you've you've got the best grades, you've got the best scholarships, you wrote the best application, you you're there, you're you're damn smart. But then there's always that kind of pressure that's unspoken of constantly proving that you belong there, mm. right? By writing better papers, by coming up with great ideas, by starting to publish when you start the PhD rather than when you finish it, and then to to get an advisor, so you usually pick the school that you want to go to based on like a famous scholar that you would like to be associated with, right? So like my field was African American studies. So I wanted to find somebody in that field that already had a name so that I could convince him or her to be my advisor and have them as a dissertation uh, director. And then that gives me a little bit more prestige, right? So that's how you choose. That's how you choose a school when you go to grad school. So yeah, it's a, you, and then you, you have to be smart enough and brilliant enough for that superstar professor to actually want to say, okay, I'll be your director because it's a lot of work for them. But what is good enough or super enough? I like, what is like, how, again, how do you end up dealing with your, your doubt? Yes, you mm -hmm. have to prove you have to prove and you have to prove, but in your mind, there's something else going on. So how do you kind of go past that fear and doubt and say, well, like, I have to do this? I don't know. For me, it, it was just a question of, uh, you know, keeping reading an extra book or or, or, or reading that extra article or, or doing that extra seminar or it was, you know, I, I didn't realize that in fact, uh, it's not about how smart you are. Everybody there is smart. Yeah. But then I, I didn't rational, rationalize it that way. I, I just thought, I just got to be the smartest. But now I realize it's not about being smart at all. It's about grind, right? And it's a, it's a question of compatibility, right? Because the person that I actually really wanted to be my advisor at first, I really disliked her. And I'm sure she disliked me too. So sometimes it's just a question of compatibility. But you don't know that when you're in that swirl, you know? It's really a swirl. You just like, whoa, you just got to, you know, keep producing. And there's always the next paper and the next book and the next call for papers. And it's why I felt like you were just on speed for a few years there because it was just go, 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 go. Yeah. And you don't even have the chance to be like, no, I'm going to take a break. No, there's already the next thing that's coming up. Oh, yeah. And I got to prep for that too. Sure. Today, how yeah. would you deal then with fear? and doubt getting in the way I would I I hit the bag man that's 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 how I deal with stuff I just put my boxing gloves on and I hit the bag that's awesome. <laughs> I've realized I can hit and it's completely legal <laughs> and I love it Thank you for sharing that entire academia journey with us. On speed. <laughs> On speed. <laughs> 11 years in four minutes. <laughs> 11 years in four minutes. Looking at all that and then seeing how you've transitioned to boxing, how would you describe success? You know, success for me, I think, is a, it's a state of mind. Right, it's the it's to be able to be happy where you're at and to be happy going to where you want to be, not just being happy when you're there. So it's totally a state of mind because uh, it's so um, it's so arbitrary, yeah. you know. Yeah, success is so arbitrary. Most people define it by you know how much how many possessions they have, but uh, you know what, or or, or power, right? And uh, too often enough, I find for women, power is uh, looks, mm. right? And I see that so much in my business. I mean, I, I, I really try to emphasize, you know, health and, and youth and all of that. And people want to, women want a thigh gap, you know? It's, <laughs> it's like, but I want to give you a clean microbiome. Just let me just, you know, let me just... No, I want a thigh gap. I'm not interested in the clean microbiome, right? So for them, because I think, because aesthetics, right? Your physical look is power. For women anyways, unfortunately. Uh, not for men, but for women. They think they can exchange that in order to advance in life, which too often is it's true in, in the society that we live in. But it's only temporary, right? Because when your looks go, <gasps> and there's nothing left. Mm. Hmm. But your brain. Speaking about power, mm -hmm. how would you define your superpower? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Hey, my superpower is probably a capa like a great capacity for, for compassion and empathy. But even that, it's not even something that I work at. It's just something, actually, it's something I wish I could disactivate sometimes because it's always there and it's 
it gets in the way of me accomplishing things, right? Um, but I think that would be probably the one thing that I can say has been consistent throughout my life is that I have this, um, not even an ability because it, well, yeah, I guess it's an ability, but it's not something I, I get, cr I should have credit for. It's just something I'm, it's just something I, I struggle with actually. I wish I didn't have it on all the time. I wish I could turn the switch off. But in that case, then I think that is one of your powers because it's not something that you have to work at. It's just part of who you are. Yeah. No matter where you've been in life, it's always been there. And you're saying, well, I wish I could shut it out. But mm. I've never heard of it that way. I mean, there are so many people I've met in my life that have no compassion at all and have no empathy. And the empathy part is where I feel, you know, you can you can feel something for someone, you could feel sad for them, but when you have no empathy, it's really you're just faking it. it there's some there's something missing to really relate or to connect with that person. Yeah, strangely enough, though, these people who lack empathy, they're really they're, most of them lead really good lives, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, do we need empathy and compassion to, you know, to, I think some people do very well without it. I could agree with you. It's something that I've been having to work on myself is to not care mm -hmm. about everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people who lack empathy end up succeeding in the business world, but maybe not in their personal because you do, in order to care for your family, your friends, your closest people, you need to have that touch. You, 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 you need that in order for people to tr even trust you. But when you go to the business world, it's like you're supposed to be wearing a mask, no feelings in here, leave your stuff from home back at home, and we're just here to make money. So in order for money to talk, you can't have feelings. Mm -hmm. It's pretty sick. I don't even know how sometimes how to juggle both of them I end up just doing both because I there isn't one or the other that I can really say I have to do this one now or I have mm -hmm. to do the other one mm -hmm. although it takes practice mm -hmm. and uh, it has to do a lot with the personality of the of the other person that you're communicating mm -hmm. with too so mm -hmm. well I admire your your um your desire to combine them because I see that's the thing is that although I, I I'm self-employed I am so not motivated by money and I'm I, I'm so not driven by money and in fact I'm, I'm not quite sure um, I, I don't think I want a lot of money too that's the thing is that I think most of the people that I know that have a lot of money and are very wealthy I do not envy them at all. I don't envy their lives. I don't envy who they are. I don't envy how they relate to the world. Um, I think it changes you, right? And I've seen it happen so many times. I don't actually think I want money. Um, so the fact that you are trying to be a business person and yet still keep that emotional side of you intact is really cool because I always thought they were not compatible. You're either one or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's kind of cool that you're actually saying no. I think you can put them together. So good for you. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have been, uh, not critiqued, but uh, I have been given some feedback from other business professionals that say they've never seen an artist and know how to do business too. Oh, wow. Yes. And mm -hmm. that was an awesome compliment. Mm -hmm. But that took a lot of practice mm -hmm. because when you're in school and you're in the arts, you don't learn about business. Mm -hmm. You just learn about creativity and create, create, create. And then once you're put out in that world, I knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and I freelanced as soon as I got out of school. But I didn't know how to do it the business way, at least back then when I graduated in 2004. So mm -hmm. it's taken a lot of time and repetition and being exposed to the business people and entourage in order for me to realize how I'm supposed to act or behave mm -hmm. or reply. Mm -hmm. And I still end up gaining a lot of trust and confidence from people when I'm more of the compassionate one. Mm -hmm. But... Mm -hmm. It tricks people because sometimes they think that they can get away with something and then I'll pull up my computer or my information and then they're mm -hmm. like, oh, what are all these files? <laughs> I'm like, well, this is you and this is what you said and I think this is not supposed to be this way, but you know, I'm just saying. 
Good for you. <laughs> but that took a lot of practice and confidence too. Uh-huh. I think what's lacking in, uh, especially in the the women's world and the way I was raised is that confidence aspect of it all. Mm. Because like you said, it doesn't really matter who's smart anymore. Like mm. when you got to your level as a PhD student, everyone is smart. I mean, you're mm. all the way there. That's mm-hmm. crazy. And uh, mm-hmm. congratulations for doing that. <laughs> oh my <Thank> goodness. <laughs> I went to, to a bachelor and I said, oof, that's plenty oh, for yeah. me. <laughs> but I, I have to say it is really difficult for women to um, to gain um, that confidence within themselves and a lot of it has to do with this brainwashing of feeling guilt mm. like I know that's how I was taught it's like I'm supposed to just you know I'm supposed to be like this and do like that and cross mm-hmm. my legs and mm-hmm. be like that but I was mm-hmm. completely the opposite mm-hmm. like and it was I don't know if it was me rebelling against that idea or mm-hmm. I just said there's got to be another way Well, hence the boxing, right? Because uh, I think uh, as women, we're socialized to internalize yeah. our anger and mm-hmm. our frustrations and our displeasure. We're supposed to be pleasant and sweet and dainty and uh, extremely generous. You're always supposed to give the best piece of meat to somebody else or the last of something, or right? So there's this, it's too bad though, because you know what? I don't think that, the, I think if we raise men and women the same mm-hmm. way, I agree. <laughs> you know, it, it this this I mean it's an age old debate, the nature nurture debate, right? Are women really essentially, you know, feminine and men is because if you you know, the women who earn more than their husbands and the husbands stay at home and the women go out to work, the the the, the stay at home dads are extremely caring and compassionate and and kind and attentive and right i mean i don't think i don't think it's like innate i don't think Mm. it's but to go back to the boxing though it's it's really that what's cool about the boxing is that you can let all of that out even though you're a girl and you could just like you may not be able to do it in everyday life on the street Um, but uh, you, you know, you can blast the hip hop and put your gloves on and, and, and be a badass. Like I said, it's completely legal to punch in your class. <laughs> <laughs> it's highly encouraged too. <laughs> so I hear you say, uh, mentioning your mother a lot through this entire mm-hmm. journey in your life. Would you consider to her to be your main support system? And if it's not her, are there others? Yeah, definitely her. Although. That too is interesting because, uh, you know, when you, when your parents age, like you're, you're not quite at that age yet, but when you're, there's a shift that happens. All my life, my mother has been my support system, but now she's, now it's kind of shifting. Now I have, it's almost like I'm, I'm the one who's slowly coming up now and taking care of her, right? So in a way, I'm kind of losing my best friend in the process because it's not the same dynamic. Also, um, Five years ago, my sister was diagnosed with uh, metastatic cancer. And ever since my sister's been sick, um, that's really changed the, dy- the dynamic between my mom and I too. I find that when something happens to someone in the family, it's not only you that experiences the emotion. Even when I went through my divorce, it seemed to have affected everyone. Oh, my God, everyone of felt like I was separating, you know, the families. And, well, that's that is really what happened mm-hmm. and I guess they just didn't want to accept it and I was told you know work harder at it like fix it do something oh, wow. yeah, yeah yeah and uh, <laughs> yeah yeah. Mm. yeah even with you know them knowing like little bits and stuff here and there and uh, and um, it's I didn't realize how Even if it wasn't happening to you, you still felt all of it. Uh And um, especially that I had to move back to my mother's place. It was either that or to a woman's shelter. Uh And my energy that I had with me and all my feelings and all my fears, 
and of course the children in that circle as well too it was just it was really overwhelming for my parents it was overwhelming for anyone who would even come to visit because they knew whenever they'd enter that door someone was crying or yeah, someone was yeah. just not wanting to have any kind of contact uh-huh. it's really hard cuz it doesn't matter even if you're in all in the same circle mm-hmm. Everyone is feeling it their own way and mm-hmm. everyone feels like they're alone. Mm-hmm. It's it's really sad. Yeah. 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 And uh, in the end, uh, what I felt was isolation. And it, it did become to that. And I said... Well, in that case, and I'm, I need to, I need to, I really need to get away. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's the reason why I, I moved here, too, because my parents don't live in this area. Okay. But I said, I need to, I need to just, I need to go where something else is calling me. <laughs> and the water called me. Mm-hmm. And I said, this is it. And I don't know if it's going to last, but for now, this is what I need Mm -hmm. so sometimes you need to go to that place like reconnect with yourself and find that peace in order for you to you know get back there and box again because that's pretty much how life is it's it's (laughs) (laughs) and honestly Uh, I'm in your class and sometimes I'm like you know what just someone punch me in the face Mm -hmm. because I want to see if I can catch it you mean catch it or take it (laughs) I don't even know, like mm-hmm. either either one. Let's mm-hmm. see which one <laughs> ends up working out. I know I have good reflexes, but I just, I... I... You know, uh, what's, uh, you actually get used to being punched in the face. Because when you, because in my class, we, you know, I'm teaching you technique and you're you're hitting pads and, and you're you're hitting the bag. But if you get in the ring, uh, it's a whole different ball game, right? Because uh, the bag doesn't hit you back, but the person in the ring is, hits you. And at first, it's, it's, it's shattering. Uh, you, first of all, the pain. I mean, it's painful. And, you know, I think uh, we're, we're, we're very, um, oh, God, we sure love comfort, don't we? we? We surround ourselves with all kinds of comfort to the point where we, we're completely unable mm-hmm. to deal with, you know, this like life-threatening, life-threatening mm-hmm. situations or being hit in the face, right? So uh, that for me was... It was really, my, nobody around me could understand why I really wanted to do this. Even my husband was like, oh, my God, you, you're just not that person. You're sweet and, and tender and, and so damn compassionate. And so you, the, how, he, he couldn't wrap his brain around it. But I, I needed to be punched in the face just so that I could teach myself to learn how to get punched in the face right Mm -hmm. and at first it's like oh my god and then you get really angry and then you kind of lose control and you go at the person who punched you and that too is something that you learn in the ring is that the minute you lose control of your emotions you've lost the fight so when you get punched in the face your reflex is to get mad and to but you you have to do the opposite you have to take a deep breath you have to calm down and then you have to your strategic mind has to come in and then you have to figure out what's the best way to get back at that person but at the right time so emotions have to be completely taken out of it because if you're emotional in your boxing you lost the fight right that's another thing that i wanted to learn because i'm so emotional and i thought well that's going to be a good way for me under pressure to control my emotions and to You know, to really, it's controlled. It's a square. It's a square with clear demarcations. And there is a clock that rings. It's a clearly determined amount of time in a clearly delineated space, right? So there's a certain amount of control to the chaos, uh, which is kind of what life is, isn't it, right? Because we have all this illusionary control, right? We, you know, we... You know, we put all of these mechanisms in place so that we think we control life, when in fact you never know what happens in the ring. I think maybe that's where it comes from, where when I said, I just want to get punched in the face just to either see it, how it feels or see how I react. Because yeah. I was going to say, you said something that I really enjoyed right now. You actually get used to getting hit in the face. Mm-hmm. And in order for you to get used to that, it's because it happens often enough that now you know how to handle it. Mm-hmm. And yes, that's exactly how life is, mm-hmm. because there's always someone punching you in the face. Always. 
there's a lot with uh, my work that I decided to to work on as well because I taught a color psychology class at uh, Dawson College. One of the colors, which is not even considered a color, is black. It's a shade, and it's one of the shades that I would barely use because black, well, there's it's nothingness. But I said, I'm going to do it the other way around. I'm going to make sure I surround myself with as much black as possible, and I'm going to find the colors in them. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up um, kind of finding a, a self-healing method through the only thing I knew how to do. And that's also the reason why most of my chairs are black. There's only color on the back of them because the the actual the actual person that's sitting on it is the canvas. They're the ones mm -hmm. who should be standing out. But if you have colors everywhere, mm -hmm. you, you end up losing focus of what's important. Mm -hmm. So black out mm -hmm. and then just find the little crease mm -hmm. of gold somewhere. Mm -hmm. When did you have your aha moment where you realized you were Lorraine Wimay? I never, never, it hasn't happened yet. No, it's a, uh, I've constantly reinvented myself, right? Like, like uh, when I was, what I was telling you before we started recording from 17 to 27, I, I was wild. I mean, wild. I worked in bars. I, I thought the most important thing was, it was to be the cutest girl in the room. You know, I, I, I was convinced I was going to be rich because I was going to marry some rich dude, which is ridiculous now when I think about that. I can't imagine that I ever thought that way. And then at 27, I went back to school and then I discovered I was smart. So from 27 to 37, um, I was in school. And then I and then at, from 37 to 47, I underwent another complete transformation. And then in my mid 40s, I became a trainer. I left, you know everything so i was immersed in this world where where my brain was like the part of 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 my body that was like doing all the work right you're as an intellectual i mean the most important in fact i mean you know you you look at girls in in clubs or strip joints for example and the most important thing is who has the biggest boobs for example in academia if these guy if people in academia could have brain implants they would do it because because it's so important to have this beautiful shiny brain right so then i i went from this completely intellectual context to one that's like completely physical because now i'm a trainer and it's all about the body it's all about what you do with your body right it seems that like every decade or so i there's a different lorraine so i i've not mastered that at all and i think uh, i'm not sure it's a good idea to hold on to to who you are, because I think life circumstances. If you don't change who you are, I remember asking somebody that I love very much, if you could go back and change things, would you? And she said to me, no. And I thought, no, how, you, no, what do you, you, have you not learned anything? Have you not learned it? How could you say no? Because, oh my God, if I could go back and I did the same thing, I would be really, it would, it would, it would have been a waste of time to go through it, right? The whole point of going through life is, is, to, is to evolve, is to change, is to shed layers, is to add new pieces, it's to, it's to become somebody else. Isn't that the whole point? Well, to me anyways. So I have no idea who Lorraine is. I have a, a kind of a nebulous idea of who I am now, uh, but I know that's not gonna, it's not gonna stick. And whatever happens, it, I'm gonna just, it's kind of like a tumbleweed. I am so happy to hear that answer. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. I told you, the microphone does things. You just yeah. end up talking. <laughs> I had no idea that I, I, I yeah, that's, yeah, I, that was a discovery for me too. Imagine. Thanks for the question. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, so we're evolving, we're changing. Yes, I agree that in order to grow, you must accept change and change from within as well. Do, do you see yourself changing into something else then, maybe in the next decade? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, 
partly because it seems that my my life is that way. There are all kinds of circumstances. Um, it, it's very it's very fluid. I'm not one of those people who I you know people there are people who have had the same job for like 30 years. Yeah, that's. I don't know how to do that. Yeah. Actually. No, I get the only thing that I've never gotten bored with is my husband. We've been married. Um, well, I'm married. We've been together 33 years now. But I. It's the only thing that is I, I've never felt like changing, but I get bored very easily. Yeah. Does your ha husband happen to be someone who also accepts change very easily? Uh, yeah, yeah. My husband, it, he doesn't just accept change. My husband is the most. When I when life throws shit at me, I put on my boxing glove and I'm like, can I swear? I'm like. We're going to cut it out. Okay, yeah. well, <laughs> I put on my boxing glove and I'm like, damn this, right? But him, it's like, you know, if it comes, it's meant to be here. And you just got to just gotta soak it in. You just got to soak it in. You just got to let it be. Just let it be. He, we are so opposite. It's a miracle <laughs> that we've been together so long. He, he is the most accepting person I've ever met in my life whatever happens he never gets angry he never gets discouraged he never gets doubtful he's 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 just so accepting I don't have that quality it's hard for me to accept stuff that happens but not for him what's your husband's name Alan I think we all want to meet yeah. Alan <laughs> <laughs> he's an exceptional man. He's also an artist. He's a, he's a singer. He's he's oh. a musician. He's a special human being. I'm lucky that he chose me. I'm like in love for you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's a beautiful man. Wow. Mm. Oh, okay, Alan. We're all we all need to meet you now. <laughs> <laughs> Lorraine, mm -hmm. you understand the concept of my queen's chair, right? Do you happen to have a queen's chair? I don't. And you know, I'm not sure that I would fit in a queen's chair. I think I'm uncomfortable with the idea. It's kind of like biographies, okay? So a lot of people say, you know, you write so well, you should write a book about your life. You, I, I don't, the whole process of biography to me is kind of like a self, being self-absorbed and in the sense that you, you think that you're so beautiful and you're so special that people want to read about your life, right? Unless you're Nelson Mandela, for example, where you've used your life exceptionally well. Because there are people who use their lives well. I think most of us try to figure out how to survive and how to stay alive and how to leave a little bit of creation here and there on our passage so as to leave some sort of mark so that perhaps in the mind of somebody we're going to live on. We're not going to be completely forgotten, right? But there are people who use their lives exceptionally well. But for the rest of us, you know, I don't think if I had a queen's chair, I would give it to somebody else. That's so generous. Who would you give it to? <laughs> Who's the queen in your, in your world? Well, that's the thing is that that changes too, right? Because as the seasons of your life pass and, and, you know, people come and go in your life all the time. I mean, when you're young, you you think that you're, you're, you're going to be forever with these people because you feel so much love for them and you think it's going to be. But that's not the case. That's not the case at all. I mean, the, there are people that I cared so deeply for when I was in my 20s that are not in my life anymore at all, and I barely remember them now, right? And it's not it's not because I didn't truly love them or they didn't truly impact my life. It's just the nature of of life, then other stuff happens. And then a brand new group of people will just flower in that garden. And then the other season is gonna come and all of this is gonna be wiped out and then there's gonna be a new garden. So I would need maybe 20 different queen's chairs. And I think at every, in every like little season of my life, I, I, I would need to give it to somebody else. But I do not feel that as of yet, with what I've done or not done with my life, that I, anywhere near deserving to sit in the queen's chair and it's not really something it's not deserving in the sense that it's not that i don't think that i i, I i'm i have a value this it's just that i think that we spend too much time as a culture giving ourselves that that special status 
right? When I think we we get so much more out of life by giving other people. Do you know the do you know the word compersion? We're gonna cut that. <laughs> No, I don't know. Okay, I know a lot of words because I read a lot of books, but I had never heard of that compersion. It's the ability to feel joy at other people's joy, at other people's successes. It's the ability to celebrate the happiness of somebody else. So that's why I think I need queen's chairs for other people when in, in certain moments in their lives, they do something exceptional. So I think that's what it is, is that you, you, we, we have this feeling that we, that, you know, that we, that we're exceptional. I don't think we're exceptional all the time. I've done some stuff in my life that I am so not proud of, but that's the nature of life too, right? So at times I'm exceptional. At most times I'm ordinary. At other times I'm mediocre. And at certain points, I suck, right? But I think that's that's part of life. And a queen's chair would mean that I think I'm extraordinary. And although I do things that at certain moments in my life I was or am, I don't think that that's a, it's, it's not one of those things. It's not like, you know, because you're a woman, you, you deserve to be, I don't think anybody deserves, why? On the basis of what? right? Just because you exist, just because you're a woman, just be, I'm uncomfortable with that, with that principle. And this is why it is a self-deserving act when you do offer yourself something, because the same as my chairs, like on my site, it's all self-deserving. So it's up to you to feel that you oh, need like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not up to someone else and it's not from someone else's voice telling you that this is what you need. It's something that you feel at this point in my life, this is going to work for me. It may not work tomorrow, but right now I feel royal. I like that. That if it's a self-appointed title, then I think, um, but it doesn't change the fact that I don't think that I would self-appoint myself right now to be in a queen's chair. But I love your queen chair, and I, I, um, if I had one, um, I would probably give it to somebody else right now. I was, and I still am like that as well. I love that word that you used. Isn't that weird? I've never heard of that word before, like a couple of weeks ago. And Not a beautiful word. Everybody should know that word. I swear. I, I think I will start to use it because I know myself. I've been raised in a compersion society where we always offer and help and give. Mm. And we've learned to appreciate the giving part. Mm. We, um, in my family, with my with my mom we always go for example we go to dominican because we have our family there but we always would bring an extra luggage of just things we would give away mm -hmm. and i learned that you know just from living in the that city in mocha where i was raised you know that not everyone is very fortunate but my goodness it is so much fun giving toys to kids mm -hmm. and just giving them pencils and erasers mm -hmm. and just the the really simple necessities mm -hmm. it it's you cannot explain that kind of joy mm -hmm. and i always loved also even after that just giving giving to whether you know it was my family members my friends something that i made i love giving away something i made i think it has a lot more value than me going to the store and picking something out like that beautiful christmas card you gave me yeah. <laughs> so everyone knows that i always make my cards because i'm so against paying eight dollars for a hallmark card that is that has someone else's words in it i can make 10 of them for eight dollars and they have so much more meaning and you can add a little gold to it i love that <laughs> it's rubbing off on her <laughs> <laughs> i have one more question mm. for you what do you deserve and how will you make that happen in 2019 yeah same thing dar i don't think i don't think that the universe owes us anything and, and the universe shows it to me every day that you it's not up to you you just i'm just trying to bend with the wind and not break and when i'm in the wind and i'm swaying i'm dancing right but i'm just trying not to break when the wind just blows and it's a, we focus too much on the stuff we deserve and we don't get and that's why we're unhappy 
Do you know what I mean? So if something comes, then I celebrate it. And if it doesn't come, very often I pout and I bitch and I cry and I get depressed and then I snap back into it. And then I, I put on my boxing gloves, I go to the gym, I have a good workout, I punch something and then I get back to life. And then I just try to navigate all of that. And I think the best way to make myself feel good is by, I know it sounds so corny, but by giving my queen's chair to somebody else, by making somebody else's day better. That's what I feel I deserve. The joy I get from when I get up in the morning, I think, okay, well, if nothing comes out of today, but me making the day better for one person, that's why I love my Saturday so much, right? Because everybody leaves there on Saturday feeling so much better than they did when they walked in. And it makes me feel like I used my life well that day. I love your authentic answer. Oh, well, thank you. I think a lot of people will learn a lot from that. Wow. You have a lot to say. There's so much more of you that I just learned in this little bit of time than I have since I started boxing in October. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow, I, sweet, I, honestly, I'm just a girl that's trying not to break with the wind. <laughs> you know. I'm happy that you just came just being you and what your thoughts are because... It's really important for people to know that not everyone fits within your world or your ideas or your concepts, yeah. but there's so much more to learn when we just put down all of those like criterias mm -hmm. and just allow the person to really express what they want to say. Mm -hmm. And that's what the show is all about. It's really finding different methods that people can relate to and from women who are real and exist and can become a real mentor to them and if someone is listening to you and it resonates the words that you're saying with them then I'm happy that I was able to help that person mm. and that's the goal of this show is finding different ways and I know it was you almost kind of opted out of it. Mm -hmm. But the reason I needed you here was because I knew you weren't going to answer the questions the way others did. Okay. And that's exactly what I want. I want people to know that there are so many differences, yet we have a lot of similarities. Now, it all depends on your perspective and what you're going to take back from that. And now go put your crown on and get out the door. <laughs> Go, go boxing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions for me? I'm intrigued by your use of the word boudoir as a brand and as a space, 1920s Paris, right? Which a lot of stuff in exactly. here is, <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, it, it's almost right out of a Victorian novel. I mean, boudet in French, like boudoir comes from boudet. Boudet means pouting so it originally yes. it was kind of like a, a pouting room it is. <laughs> before it became this space where women could just lounge on beautiful chairs and sit around with it but there's also very something very sexual about it right because it's it's also like a bedroom like a like a, an intimate like sleeping space where other things happen so tell me about that yes a boudoir is french it is from the 1800s and it was implemented to the North American um, uh, environment in the 1920s. And I do always say to myself, I think I was born in the wrong era Definitely. because... The minute I because... walked into your house, I said, wow, she's, it, she's like, yeah, she's 150 years off. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what happened was... Um, it is a space where women can gossip and pout and, you know, discuss all the things that are not appropriate to discuss outside. But it also has transitioned into a space of intimacy. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the whole transition has happened in that way, or at least uh, North America has, has implemented certain phases of its, if, of its own development 
with the idea of it just being a space that's dedicated to you, but that is safe also. It's safe for you to express with whether it's your girlfriends, you know, and you guys are just talking, having your wine and just talking about how awful boys are, or you're with your partner and you are expressing something much more romantically. I kind of discovered this whole part of me inside me, which I think in the past I was I was born in the 1920s, because I always found that uh, there was something about me that always I always wanted to talk. I always wanted to talk out loud. I always wanted to express what I wanted to say. And in uh, our family traditions is if it's not nice, like don't say it out loud, mm-hmm. you hush about it all. And mm-hmm. what ended up happening then in, in my own um, development as a teenager and my early 20s is that I had to go and find where to get help, where to go and talk, where to find the right people I can communicate with. And of course, because I wasn't taught like the the way I think is the right way, well, I ended up getting myself into all kinds of different paths in order to find, well, the path I'm in right now. Mm. When I did my boudoir photo shoot, Mm -hmm. um, it was not meant to be part of my business. Mm. A good year after I had left my ex-husband, and so I had the makeup artist and her, like, you know, doing the whole thing, but I had to have a bottle of wine because I was so <laughs> nervous doing this. And I almost th- needed a bottle of wine to come here, Dar. Oh my God, I have wine in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> With the photography and the emotions that she captured and that 1920s look, it's really, al- I'm really alive and this is really where I am. And she just made that happen for me. Your boxing class has made me see things a lot differently, too. Mm. And man, I feel so good. Mm. But the idea of just taking someone else's perspective. So in this case, my my photographer's lens, she made me unravel what I probably always wanted to do, but didn't know that I could do it. And with that, I took the energy and the power from just the images and I said, I get it now. I used to introduce myself as an interior designer and people would just stick kitchens and bathrooms to me. And Mm. those are like the flattest, least emotional spaces. Although the kitchen is the heart of the home and it's extremely important. But all I wanted to do was work with textures and patterns and and feeling. And the only way to get the most materials is if you're working in the bedroom. So it was an uh, ah moment for you. The boudoir thing it kind of directed all of your creative energy towards a business like it manifested into it it was um, a catalyst I think for what I was doing I already had the furniture by the way I already had my art it's just the when I rebranded I was also kind of rebranding myself personally I was Mm -hmm. reinventing myself but I didn't want to get out of the interior design industry because I really love doing what I do but at the same time I kind of looked back uh, at my portfolio and I noticed all the projects that I had done uh, that I really enjoyed doing and the kind of clients that I liked working for and those were always Mm -hmm. the kind of clients that really required confidentiality and wanted something that I had never done before and were very open with me because obviously in order for me to do my job they have to express as much as possible what they want and these clients they just opened up my mind and the my femininity Boudoir, boudoir, those are private spaces. Those are all the spaces that everybody hushes. Those are all the spaces that everyone's been telling me. It's awesome. Yeah, and and I said, I I want people to talk. I want to find a way for people to uh, open up. And what I've noticed, I'm getting goosebumps everywhere, is that people really open up with me. And it's not like I'm forcing them. They just feel really comfortable. And uh, so I changed my title to artistic interior designer because I love to merge art and design and I feel that art is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I came up with uh, boudoir and private spaces, which really means bedrooms, closets, 
like small spaces, your vestibule, mm -hmm. you know, storage spaces. But it's it's all about the words that you use. And yes, the boudoir does have that sensual touch to it. And I do have clients who request uh, things from all the way from the playful experience to the erotic experience. Mm -hmm. But hey, they want to actually share this with me. Mm -hmm. Like this is this is deep stuff. And mm -hmm. I am so glad and fortunate that they are sharing this with mm -hmm. me. Like I'm I'm just their interior designer. I'm not even like so the fact that I can do that, I said, I'm going to I'm going to just keep with it and see where this goes. Wow. I love it. I love <laughs> it. Uh, nobody does intimate spaces. No, we no, forget. Uh, yeah, but also the fact that you were able to find this as not just a part of your identity and, and an expression of your creativity, but as an actual niche, business niche is brilliant. So I wish you the best of luck, my dear. I fly over oceans in my sleep. If you enjoyed the voice of Boudoir Therapy, please leave your review on iTunes. Follow me on Facebook and Instagram. And every Tuesday is Social Tuesday. I'll be active on social media if you have any questions. And don't forget the full moon special. Listen in a little bit closer to my story. Want to personalize your boudoir therapy experience? Visit www.darlenewong.com under DW Boutique to purchase your copy of Boudoir Therapy, a self-deserving journal made by me just for you. And never, never stop living your inner art. Because you deserve it.